Thank you. Thanks. I can remember my mother putting out uh, a, a starched iron white sheet and my father taking it in angrily and saying, you're not putting that out. And he looked out an old singlet that had holes in it and he fixed this on an end of a broom. He thought that would be good enough as his personal flag of surrender. The occupation of Alderney, where only a handful of civilians remained, and Sark, where most had stayed, quickly followed. Before her death in 1974, the dame of Sark, Sybil Hathaway, recalled the arrival of the Germans. I sent the Seneschal down to harbour to meet them, and I told my parlourmaid to be sure that when they arrived, to show them in as if she showed in German officers every day of her life, you know. And uh, I arranged myself behind a table at the very far end of this room and made them come in at the door so that they had to walk some distance before they could speak to me. Uh, they did not say Heil Hitler as I expected. They saluted and they said they had come to give me, give me the orders for the takeover of the German commandant. Um, at first they were very reasonable. They left very few troops here, only 10 actually in a sergeant, because they were on the crest of the victories all over Europe, and I don't think they imagined for one minute that uh, it was going to last longer than Christmas. The Germans immediately imposed their rule on the islands and brought in restrictions on most aspects of everyday life. In the early days of the occupation, however, the Iron Fist wore a velvet glove and many people on the islands were surprised that, as long as they towed the line, the Germans would leave them alone. The invaders behaved correctly, anxious to present a benevolent image. This was to be a model occupation, to show the British that when the mainland too fell under Nazi rule, the people would have little to fear. Initially, there was plenty of food. The shops were full of gifts for the soldiers to send back home. For them, the Channel Islands were a pleasant place to be. If I wasn't there in the Channel Islands, I would have been somewhere else, you know. You were in the forces and wherever that it sent you, you had to go. It was very peaceful, really. Uh, there wasn't much going on. I was stationed at St. Peter Port on Duck, where you might mostly walk around. Soon after the invasion, on the orders of Winston Churchill, Second Lieutenant Hubert Nicholl, a Guernseyman serving in the British forces, returned to the island on two commando missions to gather information about the strength of the German military. My first visit to Guernsey was without any problems at all. The second visit in September 1940 ended in disaster. We landed, um, went off our various ways, got all the information we wanted. We were due to be picked up three nights later, but there was no contact. So we went back to our homes and it became very embarrassing because we were jeopardising our parents and we were looking for a way out. Once the Germans became aware that there were British soldiers in the island, a notice was published in the press saying that they were, had to surrender by a certain time. And the controlling committee were informed that if they didn't surrender, 20 hostages, important people in the island, would be taken and if nothing happened, they would be shot. We gave ourselves up under this notice um, and then they found out that I'd been to Guernsey before and this annoyed them very much. I was court-martialed and sentenced to death but the sentence wasn't confirmed either in Paris or Berlin and finally um, Berlin said they were to abide by the notice that had appeared in the paper and we came, became prisoners of war. Some of the bitter memories of those years are kept alive here in the files of the Jersey Archive Service. The Germans, of course, were meticulous record keepers, and there is here a list of everyone who lived through the occupation and some who didn't. People were obliged to tell the Germans their name, age, sex, address, occupation, and, of course, religion. The one possibly fatal piece of information was ever to admit that you were a Jew. And remarkably, only one man ever did. His name was Chaim Goldman. You see that his card is marked here with a J. Mr. Goldman was not deported, but there's been much concern about the fate of other Jews caught up in the occupation. There were 11 other Jews who registered as Jews in October 1940, along with Hyam Goldman. They didn't actually register with Jewish religion, um, but they did register of Jewish descent, which was what the order um, of the German occupying forces stated. Um, only three were actually d deported, and they appeared to have been deported not necessarily because they were Jews, 
They were deported in 1943, along with other Jersey-born and English people, just in the general deportations, and appear to have been kept together with the other Channel Islanders in the camps in Germany, and then were repatriated at the end of the war. The records show that they certainly were registered, and the Jersey authorities made sure that they, they were registered according to the German order. Um, but that is a slightly different thing from saying that they were um, persecuted and actually all deported in sex concentration camps. However, in Guernsey, there were three Jewish women who did not escape the Holocaust. The standard registration form did not inquire about religion. But in October 1940, Jews in Guernsey were instructed to identify themselves by reporting to the inspector of police. Two women did so, August Spitz and Therese Steiner. They were Austrians who'd become German citizens when the Nazis took over their country. A third woman, Marianne Grunfeld, was Polish. She did not identify herself as Jewish, but was betrayed, and in April 1942, all three women were deported from Guernsey initially to France. They arrived at Auschwitz on July the 23rd and died in the gas chambers, it's believed, on that same day. There were other deportations too. In September 1942, Hitler ordered that islanders who'd been born on the British mainland were to be sent to internment camps in Germany. The entire population was shocked as more than 2,000 people, including children, were deported. When they deported the English people in, in 16 of September 1942, you know, they were shuffling down to the island. We thought, we can't let our people go like that, our cousins. And uh, we thought they're English and it's not their fault. And, and so, so we started singing, you know, they'll always be in England and, and different wartime songs. And we got arrested. But they released us the next day because the Germans tried to play it down. They were embarrassed. They were embarrassed because they pr promised the island if they behaved themselves, they, they, they'd be respected and they wouldn't be touched. As the Iron Fist tightened its grip, the threat of reprisals against family and friends made resistance a dangerous move. The small islands offered no hiding place. They were cut off even from each other with almost as many German troops as civilians. Eileen and Jack Lesueur, farmers in Jersey, were among countless islanders who risked imprisonment, deportation, beatings, possibly their lives, by defying the enemy and keeping in touch with the outside world. You don't get much out of my finger, do you? Well, occasionally, the um, RAF used to bring us leaflets, spread them all over the island. The first one we had was to show us that Buckingham Palace had been bombed and the king and queen were standing amongst the debris. You had to hide them as soon as you had them. Good gracious me, if the Germans had caught you with one or found one in your house, you'd have been perhaps for the high jump. They might have deported you even. They were so hot on that. Those who had one used to tell everybody else <laughs> of the English news. This is the BBC Home and Forces programme. Here is the news. And this is Frederick Allen reading it. The, Germans claim the sense of isolation was heightened when islanders were ordered to hand in all their wirelesses to a depot. But their ingenuity found ways and means of defying this restriction. A lot of people made these little crystal sets in cheese boxes or tiny little things. You'd be amazed what you could hear about that. When Winston Churchill was going to speak, well, everybody knew what he had said. News was strictly censored by the Germans, but while the official newspapers were firmly under their control, a group of Guernseymen formed an underground news sheet based on BBC broadcasts. They were betrayed by an informer and imprisoned in Germany, where two of them died. There were other betrayals too, out of jealousy or to settle old scores. Hundreds of letters to the German authorities were intercepted by post office sorters, but others got through. One day, German came to search, as they used to very often, and he came and said to me, we want your radio. Oh, I said, I haven't got it. We've taken it to the depot. But he said, move. And he looked through the house, top and bottom. They were as near to it as what the grate is. But they didn't find it. Believe it or not, there was a stroke of luck. 
when they came to leave the place, I asked them, how did they come to come here? And he said, well, I'll show you. He said, your people sent that, and they did. And I recognized the paper and the writing of this lady that had sent it in. In 1941, the V for victory sign became a visible symbol of defiance around the islands. The Germans reacted strongly to this and threatened severe consequences if the V signs continued to appear. One resourceful printer, Maurice Green, produced his own cheeky response. Well, I decided that I needed to do a greetings card, you see, and I'd like to put a victory sign on it. But of course, a victory sign wasn't allowed, so I came up with the idea that if I put a line there and a line there, which I did with a potato, <laughs> incidentally, and folded it, I had a V. And I put a little verse by Longfellow in there and made a Christmas card. And I sold those for a mark each. I did very well. I printed a few hundred of them. And then Sondra Fuhrer Hall at the Evening Post, when I used to come through where we were printing the stamps and stuff, he looked at it one day, because I'd taken one in there to show one of the boys, and he picked it up and said, have you got any more? Oh, I said, you've one or two, you know. Well, he said, could I have some? So I took them in. He didn't seem to worry about the V. I don't think, re think he even realized it was there, you know, because they used to open it to look. So I took them in, and the next thing I know is that they're asking me for more and more, and there's quite a few Germans calling it the Evening Post of the German section, buying these, so I'm selling them to the Germans at 10 marks a time, you see, only a mark to love civilians, but 10 marks to the Germans. I did quite well out of it. <laughs> Islanders who did resist the occupation lived in constant fear of a knock on the door in the middle of the night. The German underground hospital in Jersey is now a museum and has a collection of photographs of some of the two and a half thousand Channel Islanders who were imprisoned. Among them, Joe Mier. The real medal of these occupations should have gone to the mothers, because they're the ones that made the sacrifice, you know. They're the ones that made, even like myself, uh, two o'clock in the morning, they took us off to interrogation. The only part I can remember about my mother then was down the prison gate. She's waiting outside and being a Roman Catholic with my rosary. And the Germans, I thought they were going to push her away, but they, they tried to explain to her, you know, that she couldn't talk to me, you know. And I was a bit unconscious, a bit dizzy, you know, knocked about, no food. And uh, she put my rosary at 2 o'clock in the morning. And she walked home and then nobody arrested her. So they're the ones who should have the medals, I, I believe. Yeah. The British had left the day-to-day -day running of civilian affairs in the hands of a small number of island officials who carried out the orders of the German command. But these officials have been accused of going too far to help the enemy, of overstepping the fine line between passive cooperation and collaboration. We had been instructed to, what was the phrase? Um, stay put and do your best to the civil population. And to my mind, every decision that was taken and every move that was made during the occupation by anybody in authority on the civil side was made with that in mind. The controlling committee were in a difficult position. For instance, they didn't know how long the occupation was going to go on for. It might have lasted forever. And they virtually were in a position at times when they were a gun put to their heads, figuratively speaking. And they had to do as they were told. It was, it was a situation where if they didn't do as they were told, then the population might suffer. Largely, you don't collaborate, but you may have to cooperate. And they're very different things, to my mind, especially having, having been there and seen it all happen. Well, I was, like so many people over here, very bitter in 1945. I've come to realize that uh, officialdom over here, all the various officials having been told to stay in office, were placed in probably a, an impossible situation. They had no option but to do the best they could uh, with all the German orders that flooded into the island. And uh, uh, I'm not so bitter about what they did as, as I was at that time. I, I just wonder what I would have done if, uh, if I'd been told uh, do what you can, carry on as best you can, but carry on. And so they did. But what about the deportations? I mean, the deportations could not have happened, or they would have been made much more difficult. 
but for the cooperation of the controlling committee. It depends on what you mean by cooperation. The Germans requested a list of all people born outside of the Channel Islands. They could have gone to the records themselves and obtained them because there was the identity card records. And so a list was provided. The, the controlling committee could have said to the Germans, right, you get on with this, here's your list, you go and pick up the people in their homes and take them as you want, which would have caused very great hardship, I, in my opinion. What happened, the controlling committee went through, the oil representative of the controlling committee went through this, and a number of exemptions were secured as a result of that. It wasn't just the politicians who had an accusing finger pointed at them. Some civilians, too, were branded as collaborators simply because they were employed by the German authorities. A lot, lot of people will tell you that they didn't work for them, but if you grew tomatoes, the Germans commandeered some of the tomatoes. If you worked in the shop, you'd have to serve them. So it doesn't matter what you did, you worked for the Germans one way or the other. One, one, uh, married people, we looked down on married men with children, free children. Who would pay them their wages if they'd refused to work for the Germans? You know, conscripted labour. They had to work. The Germans, instead of paying a person £2 a week, they paid them £10, gave them rations. And we don't look down upon them at all now. And I remember getting Wilhelm turning up and saying, will you do my washing? And he'd got a towel wrap bundle under his arm. And I thought, you cheeky thing, you think I'm going to say yes. So I said, I have children, not enough time. And he said, well, if you children, can they use bread? Well, there was only one answer. They built a lovely bakery. All you could get was the smell. No loaves for civilians. So of course I said yes. He said, that's what I've got in this towel. I can't give it to you in the street. So I asked him in. And he gave me the loaf of bread. And he said, even if you won't do my washing, you can have it for the children. Well, of course, being soft, I said, well, I'll do your washing. I kept on doing his washing right through the war. And he kept snaffling bread out of the bakehouse for me. And well, I'm not quite sure if I was collaborating with him or he was collaborating with me, but it worked quite well and I'd do it again if I had the chance. But do you think the charge of collaboration was fair? No, I don't think so. No, no, no. It, it, it's, it's easy to talk, uh, for people to talk, you know, to come along, some of the people that weren't even born in those days, but, but it's a completely different thing when you're facing them. It was a tense relationship between occupier and occupied, with an ever-present threat of danger and violence. But there were romantic involvements too. Wrong for so many people, right for a few. I knew Willie by sight at 1942, and I often saw him walking along the road, and he would salute me. And I, would, I was rather rude, I'd stick my tongue out at him. Then she disappeared all of a sudden. I didn't see her for months and months and months. And for some reason I went came back from France, and she was on the same boat as me. Oh, he was very handsome, he had thick blonde hair, and he was also very smart in his uniform. He was so polite, and always so thoughtful. The next door neighbour, Willie and I used to go in and listen to his crystal set. He used to have it under the iron bed, and he used the springs as the aerial. Willie and I would go in and listen to the news and everybody was friendly towards Willie. I, I didn't have any reaction whatsoever. It was after the war, people coming back from England, but not a lot. But I didn't... I was really hurt with my best friend. When she came back, she completely ignored me. I suppose why? Because I had a baby and her mother probably told her that my baby was German and I was going with a German sailor. I don't know. I often wish I had spoken to her, but she ignored me and I thought, well, that's that. The German government wouldn't allow us to marry. And uh, we wanted to get married. So I knew a lady, she was Quaker, and she said to me, you don't have to really go and have it officially as long as you ask God to join you together. So we decided to go to the little chapel. Because I often took Willie there. It was just after the invasion. And Willie and I decided we'd go and get married there. So we just stood in front of the little altar and asked God to join us together. <laughs> and I looked at Willie and I said, we are now man and wife. But separation was to follow. When the war eventually ended, 
Willie was sent away to a prison camp in England. Shortly after the occupation had begun, food was already running short. There were limited supplies coming in from France, but these were not enough to sustain the civilian and military populations forever. Rationing was quickly introduced as life became more difficult. We had never been self-supporting. We had cattle, we had vegetables, but things like flour and all other tin woods were imported from the mainland. We have never been self-supporting. And the cattle, of course, one can argue, why didn't you slaughter them for meat? Well, we needed the cattle to provide milk, and from the milk there was butter produced, and that was the only fat ration we had was made from butter. And the population were even restricted to skim milk, except for the children and, and elderly and invalids. So we were very limited in the amount of food we could provide for ourselves. What on the hell did you exist on? Vegetables. Vegetables and vegetables and more vegetables. Well, there was always potatoes. Weeds, parsnips, carrots. Don't talk to me about vegetables. We very seldom meet them even here. I think it's because we had nothing else then. When it was um, especially a swede, well, that was on the table every day. And the potato. It's the town people that we really feel sorry for because they really had nothing. A lot of them made friends with farmers, because you could always find something on a farm, whether it was, we used to have had a gentleman who used to come on his bicycle for miles to get even one egg for my daughter, I used to say. And we used to give him one, because sometimes we didn't have many more ourselves, because so many people were looking for food. It's amazing. But what about meat? Couldn't you, uh, couldn't oh. you have your own cattle and kill cattle for oh, food? Oh, well, you weren't supposed to. But I will agree that a few pigs or sometimes baby calves died of a heart attack. <laughs> if you want to call it a heart attack. Islanders had to improvise. They made seaweed into blancmange, acorns into coffee. Whatever they could lay their hands on was put to good use and other supplies were available to those who were willing and able to pay. There was a, a very considerable black market, of course, because of rations being so drastically curtailed, and the chance of buying anything any other way than on the black market was getting more and more difficult as time went by. Some people got very rich on this. The money that changed hands was in German occupation marks, which was the currency we were using. They weren't ac even actual German currency, they were German occupation currency. And people like me thought, oh well, these guys are going to catch a cold when they want to change their money after the liberation because nobody's going to uh, take any notice of this. But uh, much to our amazement and in fact distress, the British government agreed to honour all the occupation mark notes that were in the island. The Germans regarded the Channel Islands as of enormous strategic importance and Hitler ordered that they were to be turned into island fortresses with guns that would dominate 400 square miles of the southwestern approaches. As a result, literally thousands of tons of concrete was poured into the islands. There were gun emplacements, command and control centers, observation towers, pillboxes, bunkers, underground hospitals, sea walls and anti-tank defenses. Altogether, it was one of the biggest feats of military engineering the world has ever seen, and much of it remains as a stark reminder of those terrible years of occupation. These defences were built with the blood and suffering of foreign slave labourers who'd been brought to the islands from other occupied countries as prisoners of war and political detainees. Juan Alasson, a Spanish Republican, had fled to France at the end of the Civil War. There, he was taken by the Germans and brought to Guernsey, where he helped to build the massive Miros battery. This consisted of four guns, the biggest in Europe, with a range of 26 miles, commanding the Gulf of San Marlo. The emplacements, which took 18 months to complete, involved a vast underground system of stores and barracks with accommodation for 400 men. 
Although Guernsey is now his home, this is the first time in 50 years that Juan Alasson has returned to the Miras battery. Even after so long, the memories of the ill treatment he suffered and witnessed are painfully real. But the worst inhumanity was committed on another island. Alderney has been called the island of death, and for very good reason. These two ugly posts mark the entrance to one of three camps on the island used to imprison slave workers brought here from all over Europe. They came to build the Alderney link in the so-called impregnable chain of Hitler's Atlantic Wall. They were brought here from Russia, from the Ukraine, from Poland. There were French Jews and Spanish Republicans and Algerians too. Nobody knows to this day quite how many who died, certainly hundreds, possibly thousands and they died from starvation, malnutrition. Some were beaten to death, others summarily executed, and more still committed suicide, preferring death by their own hand to life in the hell of the Alderney camps. The conditions were extremely harsh, particularly food was very little of it. And com uh, sort of combined with German brutalities, beatings up and so on, people started di dying after four weeks and continued dying until, until particularly all winter months, they were dying at, uh, at a very, very fast rate. You know, I eventually ended up in a Zilt camp, which was for political prisoners, uh, guarded by SS with dogs and, you know, which was a camp uh, most notorious on the island for brutalities, deaths and, and, and so on. <clears throat> Uh, in, from that, I decided to escape because I had no other choice. You know, if I stayed, I would be dead. You know, I, 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 I knew it, and I preferred to take the risk and face the consequences. If I, could, if I were caught, I would be dead. You know, that's, that's, that was a very simple sort of uh, equation. <clears throat> uh, but somehow I managed to go over the wires. There was another escape, Frenchman tried to get on the raft, but the current there is so strong, you know, that he landed in France, and he was arrested immediately and brought back to the island and hanged in, in view of everybody else as an example. You see. Other slave workers managed to escape too, but when they were sheltered by Channel Islanders, everyone was at risk. The most tragic case being Louisa Gould and her brother Harold Ladronik. They had an escaped Soviet slave worker. Louisa had hidden him away uh, in her home or for several months. And her words to, to me were, I had to do something for another mother's son. And she took him in and bathed his wounds, altered her son's clothes to fit him and so on. Some kind person uh, told the German authorities that she had one of these escaped slave workers. She was harboring him. He got away in time but she was court-martialed with her brother. Uh, Louisa Gould died in Ravensbrück. Harold Ladrolinek uh, survived Neuengammer and Belsen. He was the only British survivor of Belsen. The acting rector of St. Saviour's Church in Jersey during the occupation was Canon Clifford John Cohew. His courage and defiance made him another victim of Nazi oppression. He was a very cheerful soul and we always felt he was well named because he had a booming voice which you could hear from one end of the uh, main street to the other in town. And his mission in life, as he, as he saw it, was to cheer up the population. He was prison chaplain as well as hospital chaplain. And he was also, um, with other members of the churchyard staff and parish hall, uh, in control of... Um, of a receiving set which uh, brought, which helped to disseminate the news every day. But where other people did it with more caution uh, by little bits of paper, um, Canon Cohew would do it viva voce and would be well heard wherever he was. There's one story of his going into the hospital, into a hospital ward one morning, which was used by Germans and British at the time and um, saying as he entered the news is good today 
and he paused momentarily by the bedside of a lady who looked up and said, I am a German national. She was one of the nurses. So he said, oh, not so good for you then, <laughs> and went his way. Of course, it wasn't very long before he was, he was rounded up and uh, tried for dissemination of propaganda, which was uh, a dissemination of news, which was about the most heinous of crimes in the German calendar. Canon Kohu was sent to Spergau concentration camp, where he died in 1944. One of his resistance contacts was Stanley Green, a cinema manager and accomplished photographer. There's two things that Dad did. He made little photos, actually microdot photos. He built a camera to do it, of all the gun emplacements in the island. Now, Major Morrison used to go from here to France on a buying spree for the States, buying food, coal, oil, anything he could buy. And uh, actually, Mum sewed into the lapel of his jacket this microfilm, which he took over to France and was given to the Marquis in France. Dad then made a transmitter, and members of the congregation at St. Saviour's Church each had a small section. They didn't know what it was. They hadn't got a clue. They went to, to, to church, and on the days that they were told by the vicar, which was Canon Koyu, that there would be a, a service, uh, it was usually a service after the service, they knew that they had to bring those pieces, which they bought. And then they were all put together, and then the transmitter was able to be used. Like Canon Kohu, Stanley Green was also arrested by the Germans and deported to a concentration camp via France. He was taken to a, a prison called Fren, which was an old fort. Um, there he was treated very, very badly. And they used to take him from there to the Rue Madeleine, 13 Rue Madeleine in Paris. And that was SS Gestapo territory. He had his fingernails pulled out, toenails. Stanley Green was eventually sent to Buchenwald concentration camp. There, with a group of other prisoners, he managed to assemble a pinhole camera and used it with remarkable results to record his dreadful experiences. Uh, he was a broken man, he really was. He, he was six foot two when he left Jersey. He was about five foot six when he came back. He was completely doubled up, you know, really bad and shriveled. He, he, I didn't recognize him, I'll be honest, when he came back. And he'd been in hospital a long time. He'd sit down in the chair and all of a sudden you'd see he was crying and holding his hands like that across his face. And he'd say, what's the matter, Dad? I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. You see what, Dad? All those terrible men, all those terrible men. And he used to wake up in the night and Mum, Mum would come calling me. She said, come, come look after your dad. She said, he, he's woken up again in a nightmare and he'd be screaming and, and, and shouting and he'd have his hand and the, everything pillow up over his head, you know. He did just, he was seeing things that he, that had happened in Buchenwald. Stanley Green's testimony and the photographs he smuggled out of Buchenwald were used in the Nuremberg trials. After D-Day, there was no early end to the islanders' ordeal. Food became even scarcer. The supply route from France was now cut off. Civilians and the occupation army were starving. It was at this point that the authorities in Guernsey wrote to the German commander, Graf von Schmettau, asking him to end the occupation immediately. He declined, and instead of freedom, there followed the hardest winter of those five years, a winter of siege, when everything was running out. Medical supplies dried up completely, of course, after D-Day. There were no insulin or anything like that. And I think it's fair to say that of the diabetics who were in Jersey at the start of the occupation, I, I certainly know of only one survivor, uh, that's Morris Green. One day, a German soldier came to my door. He'd got these bottles of insulin. He'd searched all over for bottles of insulin for his mother, who was diabetic. And she had been killed in a raid by the RAF in Hamburg. And would I accept these, these bottles? He never gave his name. And he, he left them with me. He was in tears when he spoke about his mother. He was crying like a child, you know. He was really, really upset. And he just put them in my hand. He turned around and he went. And I never saw him again. 
At last, in December 1944, the Red Cross ship Vega arrived in the islands laden with a precious cargo. This lovely ship came in the harbour and everyone had a parcel on the island. And uh, can you imagine the excitement when we went to fetch this parcel and the food? Oh, it was wonderful. Lovely food, tins of this and fruits and flour, uh, chocolate, which we children raved about. We hadn't seen it for a year, five years. Um, it was, well, a lifesaver to many people. Had uh, the Red Cross supplies not arrived, uh, there would have been not hundreds, but thousands of people would have died. We were by then at a very low ebb indeed. Particularly the last few months, the German morale was, was collapsing. Once the Red Cross parcels started coming in, uh, we in fact had more to eat than they did. We didn't have very much, but it was more to eat than they did. They were in our dustbins, as I can remember them now, along this road, in our dustbins, trying to collect or trying to taste the meat that was left. You know, there was hardly anything left, but some of the jelly or meat that was left in our tins, they were absolutely, uh, really starving. They knew that they were losing the war. They knew their situation was hopeless. In fact, there was a mutiny being planned for May the 1st. I joined an underground communist party here in 1942, and we possessed an old-fashioned slate bed, flat bed uh, duplicator, the kind you uh, ran a roller up and down. We duplicated transcripts of BBC radio news and things of this kind. Uh, later on, of course, we made contact with German soldiers who had a committee fomenting a mutiny. There was a meeting between two of us and one of these soldiers, Paul Mulbach, where we fenced around the subject of what could be done against Hitler uh, for two hours or more, because we didn't trust him. It could have been a setup. He didn't trust us either at the beginning. At the end of that meeting, we felt that people were genuine. We turned to and printed leaflets in German calling for sabotage and mutiny, uh, which were distributed by them amongst the German garrison. And I was appointed uh, liaison with this man, Mulbach. He was taken away from the island uh, as a POW. I was in contact with him in writing till about, I'm not sure if it was the tail end of 1947 or 1948, but it, he'd been repatriated to Germany. Much to my astonishment and dismay, I got a letter from Mulbach telling me I'd probably not hear from him again because he had a charge leveled against him. He was to appear in court as a deserter from the German army because he had deserted here at the tail end of the occupation. And I, I heard nothing more of uh, Mulba. After five years of bitter occupation, freedom for the Channel Islands finally came in May 1945. Appropriately, islanders heard that they were about to be liberated from the man who'd come to symbolize our resistance to the German domination of Europe. The ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front and uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed today. It was the following morning, shortly after seven o'clock, when the German garrison surrendered on board a British destroyer. On the quarterdeck of the Bulldog, General Heiner signed the unconditional surrender of all German forces in the islands on behalf of his chief. When he signed... With the signing of the surrender, the jailers became the jailed. The people of the Channel Islands, free men and women once again, saved from the prospect of starvation. The sense of relief was tangible. The celebrations, ecstatic. We just couldn't hold any longer, we pushed the constables aside and this party of us got to the soldiers, loved them, kissed them, knocked their hats off and we were crying and they literally were crying with us. It was in a very emotional time. Mind you, there were some sad parts. There was the cruelty, the revenge, the, 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 the old scores to settle. Me and my brother-in-law, we were standing in Boots' doorway after marching uptown with the Union Jack and this girl rushed past, and went in the corner. She was naked, the poor girl. She was only about 15, 16. 
The blood was pouring down her head where they'd cut her ear, you know, like the nuns, the French girls. But she was only a kid. And I had a, a, an old Mac patched up, a military type of Mac, a British one. I was very proud of her. And I put it, she put I was going to ask her, she, she cringed. And I put it around her, you know, and did up the button. And as she ran off up the road, I said, run home. I said, return my back to me. My, my brother-in-law said, you're, you're a fool. He said, you don't know where she lives. She don't know you. I will never forget, two or three days after the liberation, Spitfires coming over Fort Regent and zooming with tremendous noise and soaring up into the sky. And I suddenly found that I was, I burst into tears. I was sobbing, weeping copiously. And at the age of 24, you know, all our culture is to stiff up a lip and, and little boys don't cry and certainly grown-up men don't. And I looked around, and there was another man in exactly the same condition. I didn't feel quite so ashamed. One of the ministers in the post-war la Labour government came over here, well, soon after liberation, made a speech in the Royal Square, uh, which I assume he thought would be received with ac acclamation, saying that uh, the islands on examination, the islands had conducted themselves very well during the terrible five years, and there might have been some misdemeanors and things of that nature, but he was sure that they could easily be covered over and everything would be fine. Uh, he wasn't received with acclamation. People were wanting an inquiry. And in fact, uh, recently released British government papers show that the government of that day, I'm talking 1945, was very concerned, particularly about Jersey, because feelings were running so high over here and they thought that uh, something would have to be done to calm the situation. When Willie Yoenkonecht became a prisoner of war in England, he was eventually rejoined by Dolly and their son. They were formally married at a village church in Devon in August 1947. I was in love with Willie. I know he was on the wrong side, but he was just a human being, as Willie said to me. He, looked at, he didn't look at me as the enemy. For years, I couldn't have had any dealings with Germans, as Germans. Uh, not surprisingly, I suppose. But I look back to people like Mulbach that I worked with quite happily and in great secrecy during the occupation. And he trusted me and I trusted him with our lives, you might say, because that's what it amounted to. Now, I have no anti-German feeling anymore. Well, you know, forget it. You know, let's this way you never forget it you may you may it's, uh, there are some some times that all of a sudden you remember you know and it's 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 uh, sometimes it's bad you know now i've met germans in fact i have very close friends who are germans who stayed as my guests in this house charming people they like us but there's a low element in every country at every time and we must never allow a political system which allows that element to come to the top.